July 2nd, 2005. A man enters Enumclaw Community Hospital with his incapacitated friend in tow. He quickly asks the staff to help his friend, then disappears before identifying himself. His friend is rushed to the emergency room, but it's too late. He's already dead before doctors could do anything to help him. According to the Enumclaw County Medical Examiner's Office, he died of acute perionitis due to the perforation of the colon. The cause? Taking it up the ass from a horse. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of Mr. Hands. This video is sponsored by Beard Club. It can take a lot of work to keep your beard and mustache looking and feeling their best. You got a small army of products that you're gonna want. That's where Beard Club comes in. They deliver quality hardware and products that'll have your beard as good as it gets with a variety of grooming kits, trimmer kits, and growth kits. I got some of my favorite things they sent me here. We got that beard and scruff cream. Always gotta give it a good sniff before you put it on, and it's nice. You got the sandalwood scented beard oil. Put that in the mustache there. Then you got the beard balm, which is uh, really good for, for keeping the mustache fresh. The real highlight of their line, though, in my opinion, is the PT45 trimmer, which is 100% the best trimmer I've ever had. Personally, I don't let my beard get too long, but I also don't want a clean shave so I can adjust the blade length how I want, and then I can make the blade a little closer for the edges that I do want cleaner. And if you have a longer beard, it comes with a bunch of guides. I've also been in a situation so many times when, you know, you get started, and all of a sudden your trimmer dies halfway through because you didn't know how much battery was left. This is one that tells you how much battery is left so you don't have to worry about that situation. Not that you'd have to be concerned about it much to begin with because the battery lasts a really long time. Over your best beard today and take 20% off your first order when you go to beardclub.com slash wang and use code wang. Of all the big shock videos that I haven't covered on this channel yet, Mr. Hands is definitely the one that gets requested the most. And at first I had actually thought that I hadn't watched the original video. Then I looked it up and it all came back to me in an instant. From what I've seen, the uploads of it that are floating around online right now are edited. The audio is removed and the intro has been cut out. But I was able to find archived uploads of the original dating back as far as August of 2006. It begins with that classic Windows Movie Maker title animation. The kind that reminds me of those top 10 heaviest metalcore breakdown compilations. It reads, Zeta Mo Beta Productions presents Deep Thrusts, starring Mr. Hands and Super Stud the Wonder Horse. I can't play you the rest, obviously, but here's the play-by-play. -play. The film opens with a nighttime shot of a man in a gray hoodie with his pants pulled down. He's bent over next to a horse. Another man, also dressed in a gray hoodie, pulls on the horse's front leg. After some pulling, the horse mounts the pantsless individual, and this move brings the horse's massive erection into the frame. With a little bit of a struggle, the other man guides the horse cock into his friend's ass. The horse is bracing itself, the guy's gasping, and then you get this sound that's like squishing your hand in a plastic bag full of macaroni. Also, the guy seems to have three spikes on his balls. Because of the low resolution, it's hard to tell if they're piercings or some kind of growths. The horse starts thrusting really hard and the guy makes these sounds that are like, you're touching the walls in doom looking for the secret, but there's no secret to be found. Then the horse busts, he withdraws from the guy's ass, and the other guy goes, he came, with his voice of absolute wonderment. Then he reaches out and starts swatting at the horse dick like a cat playing with a toy mouse. The guy that got diddled goes, oh god, in a half-pained, half-pleasured voice. And that's the end. The whole ordeal lasts about 42 seconds. And legend has it that this man died shortly after the video. So how did these guys find themselves in this predicament? In the before times, before the internet, you might have a guy here and there that was interested in hooking up with an animal. You know, like the archetypal sheep fucker of the Scottish countryside. But before the internet, most of these kinds of guys probably just went through life thinking that there is a specific thing messed up with only them. And with no outlet for their paraphilia, they basically just defaulted to living a normal life. But with the internet, all of a sudden these people start finding each other. Although very, very rarely would these people ever meet in real life for obvious reasons. But there's one exception. A little enclave of horse fuckers in Washington State. In fact, according to Charles Madutta, the writer of the documentary Zoo, this was the only real-life zoophilia club of this sort that him and his team were able to find. And of all the states in the U.S. that this could possibly happen, Washington was a likely candidate. You see, this is because at the time, Washington was one of a handful of U.S. states in which bestiality was legal. Although you might think, oh, this is because they hadn't had an incident yet to merit a law being made. In the case of Washington, there actually was a law, but it got repealed in 1976. 
Around this time, Washington was one of many states that was repealing their laws forbidding anal and oral sex. But in the case of Washington, the laws against bestiality were attached to these laws. So once these laws were repealed, bestiality effectively became legal. And thus, Washington State becomes the horsefucker's paradise. But even with the law set up in their favor, there were a few other states where you could do such a thing. But Washington had one thing that the other states didn't. A man named James Michael Tate. James Michael Tate lived in a trailer that was next to a farm that was the home to several horses. He was also involved in the online zoophile community. But unlike most of his peers, he was actually interested in cultivating a real-life group of people with this shared interest. So after a thorough vetting process, James would start to bring these people into the fold. They'd get together for weekends, holidays, have food and drinks, great conversations with like-minded people. In the documentary Zoo, which spends time with some of these people, they describe how liberating it felt to have a group of people with this freakish shared interest and be able to discuss it openly in real life. Oh, and you know, also how great it was to have a place to go get fucked by horses. A farm that, unbeknownst to its owners, had become somewhat of a destination for zoophiles around the world. They even had the horse fucking down to a science. In an interview with Vice, Charles Medetta describes it. How exactly did they train the horses to fuck them? They would literally bend over and wait for the horse to fuck them. They'd also put some type of scent on themselves. The pheromone people used to get horses to breed. He also describes their vetting process for the animals. Did they pick specific horses from the farm, or were they down to be fucked by any horse? They had preferences. They would figure out which horse was too strong, which had the biggest cock, which was the quickest fuck. It was like going to a horse auction. They were really into the cows, too. One of the guys literally said he planned on eating one of the bulls after it fucked him. I found that to be very problematic, getting fucked by something you were going to eat. He was super darkly into zoophilia in a way that was unlike the others. Yeah, I mean, fucking a bull is one thing, but eating it after? It's a bit too far. I think we discovered the next PETA campaign. A lot of these guys wanted to see themselves as massive animal fuckers. Guys who could take on huge things. They would even talk about fucking dolphins, which supposedly have big cocks. He also went on to question whether it was the animals they were really into, or maybe they were just next level size queens. To me, it's clear today that these guys had this worship of cock that may have had nothing to do with horses. Fucking posers. And as part of the ritual, sometimes the men would go on to fuck each other and post videos of it online, along with, of course, videos not unlike the infamous Mr. Hands video. So anyhow, one day James Tate brings Mr. Hands into his little group. Mr. Hands was a divorced 45-year-old engineer who worked for Boeing. Years prior, a serious motorcycle accident had caused nerve damage that reduced his ability to feel a lot of sensations. This caused him to try and seek out new ways to feel something. Anything. It begins with things like fisting, gigantic dildos. And eventually, he gets curious about the horses. And this is how he winds up seeking out Tate's little circle. For quite some time, he had been a part of their little group, regularly getting fucked by horses along with his pals. But on that fateful night of July 2nd, disaster strikes. Although there was a horse on Tate's property that the men would usually engage with, this night, for whatever reason, it just wasn't happening. So Tate, Mr. Hands, and an unidentified third person who was working the camera would go to the farm to meet up with a horse that they knew as Big Dick. While the third man is filming, first Tate gets fucked by Big Dick. And then right after, it's Mr. Hands' turn. But for some reason, this time, Big Dick was just too much to handle. And that's where Mr. Hands gets his colon perforated. He immediately knows that something has gone horribly wrong. But he refuses to go to the hospital because there's just too much at stake. He couldn't risk Boeing finding out. And worse, he couldn't risk his family finding out. So he decides he's just gonna try to, you know, walk it off. Hours pass, though, and they realize this isn't getting better. This isn't something he's going to be able to just tough out. Either they get this man to the hospital, or they're going to have a dead body to deal with. But as you know, it was a little too late. Who knows if they could have saved him if they'd only gone sooner. But for the survivors, their friend dying was just the beginning of their problems. Using Mr. Han's driver's license, police eventually track his co-conspirators back to the farm, and it was there that they would discover hundreds of VHS tapes and DVDs of these men fucking horses, one of which contained the incident that ended Mr. Han's life. So this should be a pretty open and shut case then, right? Not so much, because if you remember, there's no bestiality laws in Washington. So I had to find something else. Perhaps animal cruelty? Well, after reviewing the videotapes, and remember, authorities had to sit through hundreds of these tapes. They determined that they couldn't go for animal cruelty because there's no evidence that any of the animals were actually harmed. So what happens is James Michael Tate gets charged with criminal trespassing because, you know, the owners didn't know that these people were going on the farm to fuck their horses. He winds up with a suspended one-year sentence, a $300 fine, 
one day of community service, and he's forbidden from ever visiting the farm again. The Kings County Sheriff's Office expected that no media outlets would report on this case due to the gruesome details, which shows that they have absolutely no idea how the media works. This would be the Seattle Times' biggest story of the year. But an interesting thing about it, Mr. Hans' real name would be withheld from all of the early reporting. There was a rumor that feds or some kind of powers that be were forbidding anybody from using his name. And considering how readily the media usually names people, and that Boeing might have had some kind of sway, because, you know, they wouldn't want to be known as the horse fucker company, it is kind of plausible. But then, the radio DJ Tom Likas one day just let it all out live on the air. He identified Mr. Hands as Kenneth Pinion, the Boeing employee. His family, of course, were mortified by the whole situation, and with all this looming over their heads, they still had to deal with his estate, which previously, unbeknownst to them, included a property with a house and a barn that he was building, as well as a horse he had purchased named Strut. You see, all this time, Pinion had been building this new house in hopes that his wife and kid would eventually come back to him and live there with him, but they only learned of this when it was too late. Also, a cast of the horse's penis was found inside the house. The horse was taken by an animal rescue and gelded immediately after. They did this so none of the other horse fuckers wandering around town tried to buy it for nefarious purposes. And of course, this case more than anything left the people of Washington State wondering how the fuck is bestiality still legal in 2006? A Washington center named Pam Roach quickly made a bill to ban bestiality, which was passed the following February. But luckily since then, they haven't had to actually use this law for anything. It makes sense, because for these guys, the party was already over. And according to Charles Madutta, there was a bit of an air of resentment towards Mr. Hands. After all, he's the one that ruined the horse fucker's paradise. When I was talking to the zoos in Washington, I got an impression that they thought Mr. Hands was a bit of a weakling. He was an intellectual. He worked for Boeing as an engineer. They could take a horse fucking and not have to go to the hospital. He was a fet and new to it. They thought he ruined it. If he wasn't so self-destructive, they'd still be fucking horses on weekends. Dumping him at the hospital was really dumping him into the media and mainstream, and ending the thing they had going. And of course, with the landscape of Washington changed forever now, they had to scatter around the country. In fact, James Tate would find himself arrested once again for horse fucking, and pony fucking and dog fucking, this time in the state of Tennessee in 2009. For his crime, James would receive 10 years of probation, and his accomplice, the farm owner Kenny Thomason, would receive two. Over the course of the next few years, several states would finally add bestiality laws. But believe it or not, there's actually two that still allow it. Wyoming only banned it in 2021 as a reaction to an incident that had happened the year prior, also with horses. Hawaii also banned it finally in 2021, at least this with two spots, New Mexico and West Virginia. I'm just going to assume they haven't gotten around to it yet, and it's not that they're huge bestiality enthusiasts. And that just leaves us with the matter of the actual viral video. A lot of people take for granted that this is the actual video in which Mr. Hands gets killed. In fact, a lot of people describe it as being way more graphic and violent than it actually is. There's always been some debate over whether or not this is the video, and whether or not that's actually Mr. Hands in the video. Some have even claimed that they've seen this video before the incident. In fact, even the Two Guys One Horse website, which Joe Rogan famously promoted, notes that it's assumed but not certain that this is the same man who died. So here's my opinion. I think this video does show the actual Mr. Hands, but I don't think this is that same incident that killed him, and I'll tell you why. So if this is the video where he gets killed, it's unlikely that the men who recorded it would have went right away and uploaded it to the internet. They had way too much to deal with at that time, so it would have necessarily been leaked from the police department. But there's something in it that tells me that this isn't what happened. The Windows Movie Maker title screen. Now, anybody could have found the leaked video and added a title screen at the beginning just to be a wacky, silly guy. But there's something in the title screen that tells me that this video is most likely uploaded for the enjoyment of the Zoophile community. The name Zeta Mo Beta. Zeta, if you don't know, is the sixth letter of the Greek alphabet. And it's also a dog whistle that Zoophiles use to identify each other. You might have seen that squiggly line around on Twitter. This is a relatively commonly known thing now, but in 2006, I think it's highly unlikely that someone would have known to make that reference if they were just memeing on it. So to me, it's extremely likely that that video originates from inside the community. On top of that, the video identifies the man as Mr. Hands, and this does appear to be the actual nickname he had used with his friends. So to me, the evidence points to the fact that this is in fact Mr. Hands in that infamous video, but it's an earlier video and not the one where he dies. But anyway, that's all for the Mr. Hands story. 
If you like this video, check out my video about DolphinSex.org. I'm out.